Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for this incredible meeting and for giving me the opportunity to come here and present uh, the research that we have been doing in Mexico, particularly the case of hybridization in Mexican red oaks. So uh, this, this work was done by a student in my lab. So. Uh, Selene, who did all the actual work, with some help with, uh, by other persons, including Janine, who is here. Uh, so, to start, uh, we all know that hybridization in plants is very frequent, and that it has several different important ecological and evolutionary outcomes, including, uh, for example, the reinforcement of reproductive barriers, but also, on the contrary, the merging of, ta of hybridizing taxa, or the genetic assimilation of rare taxa by more common taxa. Uh, also, the transference of characters between hybridizing species, or the appearance of transgressive or novel characters in, in, the, in the hybrids, or even the establishment of evolutionarily independent hybrid lineages, that is, uh, hybrid speci speciation. And well, we all know that oaks are an emblematic example of a group with a very high frequent frequency of hybridization, as can be exemplified by this figure here in this paper by Harding in 1975, where he indicated all the hybridization interactions among 16 different white oaks in the eastern United States. And at that time, uh, he thought that these two species were the only ones that were isolated from, from all the other ones. But uh, Andrew Hip recently, in, in this latest issue of the, of the Journal of the International Oak Society, has pointed out that these two species also hybridize, actually. So none of the species are actually completely isolated. And all of them can hybridize. But uh, what outcomes of hybridization have been reported for the oaks. Uh, several ones, like including the formation of hybrid taxa, have been re has been reported. Also, the reinforcement of the reproductive barriers. But uh, the most frequent outcome seems to be actually uh, when the species do not merge, uh, nor produce hybrid taxa, but maintain some degree of gene flow between them. And this raises very interesting questions about like, the possibility of collective evolution, that is the rapid spread of advantageous alleles among sets of species, as has been uh, explained in previous talks on Monday. And also the possibility that species uh, differences are maintained by disruptive selection. And this uh, refers back to this concept of a semi-permeable species barrier that can stop some genes from integration, but actively incorporates other genes into the genomes of the species. Uh, so one way to understand what is happening or what is the dynamics of hybridization is to look at the structure of hybrid zones. So that is what is called hybrid zone analysis. And for a long time, hybrid zones have been considered like an interesting window into evolution, evolutionary processes or natural laboratories. And uh, basically, a hybrid zone is an area where individuals from genetically differentiated populations meet, mate, and produce offspring. And these hybrid zones are usually produced after secondary contact of species or populations that have diverged previously in, under allopatric conditions. So let's imagine that this is a hybrid zone between two species that have recent, recently been into secondary contact. So this is a spe species A that has a character X, and this is a species B with a character Y, and this is the hybrid zone where you see both characters. And to analyze this hybrid zone, what, what one can do is to, like, to draw a transect from species A to species B across the hybrid zone and to record the frequency of, for example, one of the characters. And what you will see is a climb. So it's a gradual transition, like, for example, this part here where the species A lives. So none of the individuals have the character Y. And then you see this climb with a sigmoid shape. And then you see uh, the other species. So these this kind of clients are very common in these hybrid zones. 
And what is interesting is that what happens after the contact depends on the relative fitness of the parental forms and the hybrids. For example, in the case when both parental genotypes and the hybrids have the same fitness, what happens after the contact is that these clients can widen and you know, the, the species start to merge. Uh, the other thing that can happen is that, that one of the parental genotypes has a higher fitness than the hybrids and than the other parental, and in that case you see like the, oh sorry, the client moves and one of the species get like absorbed by the other one. Uh, other possibility is that the hybrids actually have like the lower fitness uh, compared with both parentals, and this is independent of the environment, basically because of incompati incompatibilities between the two genomes that are uh, mixing. And in this case, what happens is that the client stays narrow, uh, and this is called a tension zone that is maintained by constant gene flow from uh, parental species into the hybrid zone. And, but hybrids are selected against within the hybrid zone. Or it can be that uh, the fitness of the parentals and the hybrids actually depends on the environment. So in this case, uh, the decline or the hybrid zone is associated to transitional or uh, you know, intermediate environments. So you have environment A here where species, species A lives, then you have a transitional environment where the hybrid zone is, and then you have environment B where the uh, species B lives. Uh, but it could also be that the environment is not like a gradient, but it's a, a patchy, a, a different patches of different environments are intermixed. And in this case, you don't see like a simple climb, but you see some broken pattern like this, and this is called a mosaic hybrid zone. Okay. Also, uh, we can divide hybrid zones into two main types according to the frequency of parental and intermediate individuals. So basically we have what is called a unimodal hybrid zone and bimodal hybrid zone. So in the unimodal hybrid zone we see like a high frequency of intermediates and a low frequency of parental individuals. And in this case we can infer that there is a lack of presigotic isolation or selection favoring the intermediate forms. But in the case of the bimodal hybrid zone, we can infer that there are persigotic barriers or selection against the intermediate forms. So, okay, we have applied this framework, uh, all that I said, to the, stu to the study of uh, hybridization be between these two Mexican red oak species, which are Quercus laurina and Quercus affinis. So as you can see, they are quite different. So they, they can be easily separated when they live in, allo in allopatric conditions, when they, only one of the species is occurs in a population. And according to the new phylogeny, these are non-sister taxa. Uh, so they are related, but not, not uh, sister taxa. And uh, nevertheless, they produce like a wide range of intermediate forms when they occur in sympatric conditions. And this was first described by the Mexican taxonomist uh, Susana Valencia in 1994. And what is the distribution of the two species? Uh, one of the species, Quercus laurina, is basically distributed in the central part of the country. This is like uh, the trans-Mexican volcanic belt, so it's a a high, uh, high elevation mountain range across Mexico, and also in, in Oaxaca. So that's the distribution of this species. And the other species, Quercus affinis, is distributed more in the Sierra Madre uh, Oriental, near to the uh, Gulf Coast, but also in Oaxaca. So as you probably can guess, that's the area where the intermediate forms occur, and that's where the hybrid zone is located. So what we have done is that we have a sample across the hybrid zone, basically sampling uh, populations that are apparently pure uh, Quercus laurina populations, some populations in the hybrid zone, which is in the dark gray, and some uh, affinis populations in this other color, well, gray. So the blue, the blue dots indicate affinis populations, the green ones indicate contact zone populations, and the red ones indicate uh, Quercus laurina populations. 
And what we did is, it, well, we went to the field, we collected leaves and acorns from 15 individuals uh, per site randomly. We, we weren't looking for hybrids or pure parental, so we just randomly uh, collected the individuals. Uh, then we went back to the lab and we did all the genetic analysis with nine uh, microsatellites, nuclear microsatellites. And we also quantified several leaf and acorn traits. And uh, we obtained climatic variables for each site from the World Clean database to see if climatic variables could explain some of the uh, patterns of variation that we, that we saw. Uh, so now the results, what we observed, uh, using the genetic, uh, the microsatellites, the nuclear microsatellites. First, we saw a low FST, low but significant FST. So that means that uh, populations are basically sharing most of the genetic variation, are not, differentiation is not very high, but this is very common among oak species. But the assignment analysis, this is the same kind of analysis that has been explained several times in, during the, mo the Monday sessions, indicated that there are two main genetic groups uh, so one is the red group that is found in the Quercus laurina populations and, well, in one population of the contact zone. And then we have also the green uh, genetic group that occurs with a higher frequency in the Quercus affinis populations. But we have a transition zone where you can find both genetic groups intermixed and you also find some admixture individuals, genetically intermediate individuals occur in, this, in these two populations and, well, a few ones even in here. And if we graph the frequency of the different genotypes, so this is the Q, the Q value is here, the Q value is here. So this Q value indicates whether, what is the proportion of, of the genetic groups. So uh, very low Q values indicate like pure Laurina individuals, high Q value indicates uh, pure affinis individuals, and all these individuals can be regarded as intermediate or hybrids. So we see that the, the shape of the, of the hybrid zone is clearly bimodal. So this would suggest that there is some degree of presigotic isolation between the two species or that uh, intermediate individuals are under negative selection. And if we do the Klein analysis for the proportion of the affinis genetic group in the populations, so this each one of these dot is a population, and the scale here indicates the proportion of the affinis genetic group in that population. So we see that we can fit a very nice sigmoid Klein that is quite narrow. And this suggests the dynamic of a tension zone, which, as I said, is maintained by negative selection against hybrids, but inflow, gene flow from the parental populations into the hybrid zone. The thing is that when we look at other traits, other characters, like for example, leaf shape or acorn mass, we don't see that very narrow uh, climb. So what we see is a smooth, wider climb. So these contrasting results indicate that maybe uh, these traits are either uh, plastic or that these traits are not under strong negative selection uh, as, as we saw in the, other, in the other figure. But still other traits, like other morphological traits, show it very different patterns of variation. Didn't, didn't vary like a climb, but show it like different kinds of, of patterns. So these are the populations. This is Corcus laurina, this is the contact zone, and this is Corcus affinis. And what we see is all well, the traits were standardized. So uh, we, all of them could vary between zero and one, and we could compare them. And uh, I'm showing the trait, and also I'm showing uh, some environmental variables, like for example, altitude here, precipitation in the warmest quartet here, and altitude here again. And what we see is that a trait, for example, stomatal density, uh, is highly correlated with the altitude of the populations, but doesn't have like a clean out pattern. Uh, petiole length is correlated with the precipitation in the warmest quarter, and the frequency of a trichome type, a particular trichome type that occurs in this, in the, uh, on the lips of this species, is correlated with altitude. So, the conclusions of this part might be that uh, first. Uh, 
The genetic ancestry in the populations indicate a bimodal hybrid zone and a steep narrow climb. So this would indicate some degree of presigotic isolation or selection against the hybrid. However, some morphological traits show wider, smoother clines, and others do not show geographical clines, but correlate with environmental variables. And it could be suggested that this indicates that different characters and different, different genomic regions are under the action of different forces in this hybrid zone. So there could be intrinsic selection against a recombination of some genomic regions, you know, like in the tension zone model, but there could be also some extrinsic selection by the environment favoring some genetic combinations that could be favorable under certain conditions. Okay, so to look at this more closely, the, what we did is that we planted all the acorns that we measured, and we did a, a small common garden experiment with only six populations in this case, because unfortunately, unfortunately we could not uh, get enough plants from one of the pure Quercus laurina populations. But anyway, we planted the garden, and uh, after all the seedlings germinated, we genotyped the seedlings, and this is what we observed. So these are seedlings that we genotyped these are the six uh, populations, so this is Laurina. So you see that the proportion of seedlings with uh, the Laurina genetic group is very high. Almost all individuals are uh, pure Laurina here, but these three populations, which are the ones from the contact zone, have a high proportion of hybrids, and particularly this population right in the middle of the hybrid zone is dominated by hybrids with a few la pure Laurina individuals. And you see, well, that it has a nice shape, and then you get like more uh, affinis individuals on these more northern populations. So after knowing the genotype of each seedling, uh, well, we, we let them grow for a year, and after a year, under uh, optimum, optimal conditions, uh, we measured several morphological and physiological traits. And what we got is a series of different patterns de depending on, on the trait. So for example, uh, leaf oh, uh -oh. Leaf area, and uh, so this is a photosynthetic rate. Leaf area and photosynthetic rate vary in a more or less clean out pattern, uh, but other traits, like for example, stomatal density have this shape again. So this resembles like what we observed with the adults from the field. And uh, the relative growth rate also has some kind of shape like this. So actually, the, the individuals from the intermediate populations tended to grow a little bit more than the, than the pure individuals from the extremes. Uh, and also, when we analyzed whether some of these traits were correlated with the environment at the populations of origin, and we found, we found some correlations. For example, the maximum photosynthetic rate is correlated with temperature seasonality. Transpiration rate is correlated negatively with total annual precipitation. And growth rate is negatively, negatively correlated with precipitation seasonality. So, it looks like there are some uh, correlations between the environment of origin and the, the physiological traits that we see in the common garden. Okay, and after that, what we did, we did an, an experiment, an extreme drought experiment. So we were trying to actually kill the plants after taking care, take care of them. So we suspended uh, water for for extended period of time, and what we did is that at, at at several intervals, we measure several of the physiological functions. So this is zero days, seven days, 14 days, and 21 days. And you see all the physiological functions declining uh, after basically seven days. Well, between seven and 14 days, they start to decline. Uh, and after 21 days, the plants were actually dying. So they didn't have any photosynthetic activity. And uh, well, they were in really bad shape. But what I want you to see is that one population, which is that one, in all cases had a higher capacity to maintain the physiological functions. And this population is precisely that one that was dominated by the hybrids and that came from the central part of the hybrid zone. Uh, and well, after that, we gave water to the plants again, so we didn't really want to kill them, just a little, as close as possible, but not really. <laughs> And we looked at uh, 
at the survival, survival after drought. So as we see, uh, also the, that population, that particular population had 100% survival after drought. And you see, in general, the intermediate populations had a higher survival than the parental populations. And finally, we wanted to know if this pattern of survival can be explained by any trait. And so we look at correlations between survival and different traits. And the only one that was significant and that was very interesting was leaf area. So apparently, uh, hybrid, I mean, populations from the hybrid zone have a smaller, smaller leaves. And that, that can explain why they survive better to drought. And population from parental, uh, population, yeah, from the parental species have larger leaves and they have lower survival. So that, that could be one potential me mechanism to explain why the hybrids can survive better. So as conclusions, uh, we can say that populations differ in several morphophysiological traits, but there was not a clear pattern of higher or lower performance of intermediate populations versus the parental populations under our common garden conditions. But under water stress, one of the populations that was dominated by hybrid individuals and situated in the center of the geographical gradient showed a higher capacity to retain physiological functions and survive. So we are thinking that uh, if selection pressures are temporally variable, like for example, sometimes there are droughts, but not all the time. So this, this is a variable selection pressure. Uh, so this will create opportunities for different genotypes to get established and persistent and persist in the population. And this can be a mechanism that explains why hybrid zones are maintained. So uh, that's it, and thank you very much.